right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Readings in Contemporary Poetry Series. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming out on a cold winter's evening. Uh, <laughs> uh, curated by Vincent Katz, uh, Dia's Readings in Contemporary Poetry Series was reinstated in 2011, and we take the opportunity to highlight commonalities among poets, aesthetic or personal, and also to present writers of different generations and create parallels between their voices and their work. So tonight, uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome our two poets for the evening, uh, Robert Kelly and Anna Moskovakis. Thank you both uh, for accepting our invitation and generously being a part of the series tonight. I want to also thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, whose generous support helps make uh, the evening possible. And we also give a special shout out to the Brooklyn Brewery for the complimentary beverages, and also to our whole staff who helped make these events possible. Um, so quick uh, schedule announcement <laughs> for tonight. So uh, Vincent's going to introduce our first reader, and then we'll have a quick break if you want to take a look at the book card or get a second beer for the evening, uh, and then we'll resume uh, with our second reader. So it is now my pleasure to welcome up Vincent Katz, and he's gonna introduce our first speaker for the evening. So welcome, Vincent. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about tonight's reading. This is the last reading of the season. We're gonna take a little break and then resume again on February 3rd with Bruce Andrews and Nada Gordon. So come back for that one and check out the rest of the spring schedule online. So first I will introduce Anna Moskovakis, who will be the first reader. And then we'll proceed with the rest of the evening. Anna Moskovakis is a poet, translator, and editor. Her most recent books are You and Three Others Are Approaching a Lake, a book of poems published by Coffeehouse Press in 2011, and The Jokers, a translation of a novel by Egyptian-French author Albert Cossery, published by New York Review of Books in 2010. She is the author of a previous book of poems, I Have Not Been Able to Get Through to Everyone, and the translator of works by Claude Cahun, Blaise Sendrar, and Henri Michaud, among others. Moskovakis teaches at Pratt Institute and in the Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts at Bard College. She's a longtime member of the Brooklyn-based publishing collective Ugly Duckling Press, and she lives in South Courtright, New York. Anna Moskovakis' poetry alternates between plain spoken language and philosophy's erudition. Maybe she wants us to realize that the two are interchangeable. As such, her poems tend to look different. Some are small chiseled clusters, while others feel like infinitely expandable collections of prosy sentences, which, however, sound like poetry, alerting the reader or listener to the poet's finely tuned ear. There's another alternation in Moskovaki's verse between lofty ambition and almost, and almost abject humility. The artistry involved in these decisions and the creation of verse that seems so natural, seems to mimic the patterns of the human mind, is an impressive feat. Her poetry is at once eminently accessible and audaciously stylish. Even her titles often embody the forthright ambition of rock and roll. I have not been able to get through to everyone could have been a Stone Roses album title if they had been able to admit not having gotten through to everyone. There is also something filmic, perhaps French, in her scenarios. Here is one from Second Preparation, quote, stop reading, better, isn't it? Now that we're on heightened ambivalence alert, I'd like to review the coming year. One, separation. Two, a reconciliation. Three, a separation, and so forth." End of quote. 
In You and Three Others Are Approaching a Lake, Moskovakis moves further into philosophy, taking up its burden in the branch called morals. Quote, to be fed, to keep warm and dry, quote, we read near the poem's beginning as a, quote, procedure, but we know she means for us to understand it as more than that, as a basic need. That it should need to be mentioned at all is a stark reminder, a reality check, a perspective recalculation that Moskovakis is so adept at. Much of You and Three Others involves the poets navigating a sea of language, similar to the seas we all daily find ourselves surrounded by. That she is able to chart a course that is shapely, timely, expansive, realistic, and humorous is an energizing achievement. Please help me welcome Anna Muscovakis to Dia. Thank you, Vincent. And thanks, Megan, wherever you went to. Um, and thanks to Dia, and thanks to all of you for coming out on a cold and blustery evening. You can hear me. Um, <clears throat> I've been very busy translating lately, which is kind of um, similar and different from writing. And uh, so the first thing I'm going to read to you is not exactly one of my translations, but something that I do in an ongoing manner, which is a sort of a transposition of somebody else's diaries. It's, um, there's this wonderful book by the wonderful poet and fiction writer Aaron Coonan called Grace Period, which is his notebooks. And um, somehow I got in the habit of transposing them. So I'm gonna read some of those sort of as a warm up, and then I'll read a long poem. So this is part from part two of Aaron Coonan's notebooks. And um, his title, which I've not translated or transposed, is Won't Everything Turn Out Fine? if it turns out the way I want. One. Oh, and I just wanted to say that I don't really have a principle for doing these. Sometimes I'm kind of um, re just replacing the content and using the form, and sometimes I'm actually talking with him or you know, conversing, responding to his entries. One. I think my problem is that no matter how much I return to original sources, I don't totally get what people think we should do about ideology. I think my problem is that no matter how much I dig people who do, I don't see this as a totally ignorant position. Two, heightened sensitivity. Conversations that produce this condition. Does ideology heighten sensitivity? Does the internet? Three, his confidence in rhetoric. Enlightened people know it because enlightened people argue it. Couldn't you say ignorant people know it because ignorant people argue it? How well does argument represent enlightenment? How else do you figure lessons learned? Four, I regret my participation in any public discourse on politics. And I also regret my failure to participate in many public discourses on politics. Five, I too am prey to old affects. I too am at the mercy of outdated emotions. In addition, I find old beliefs I never acknowledged I held influencing my current behavior. I find beliefs I don't believe in speaking through me. Six, being dumb. If she was dumb enough to ask herself, who am I, she would fall flat on her face. Because who am I creates a need. And how can you satisfy that need? Those who wonder are incomplete, the hour of the star. Dumb, a way of thinking that stumbles in the sun. Dumb, whereof one cannot speak, silence. Seven, debating. Example of complicity between superego and id. Eight, the way he cupped his hands over the phone, how those cupped hands took me. Nine, Anna, short for Anna Monopia. Ten, 
I would like to say that I seldom fall prey to jealousy. I am possessive of everything in my orbit, conversations, things I am reading, the privilege of attending certain events. How to keep jealousy uncharacteristic. 11. How are you going to narrate our present condition, the condition you have not ventured yet to name? 12. Why do you close your imperatives and open your hands? 13. He made the face of a person trying to stifle a smirk. 14. When we say we're going insane, we mean something different from what we say. When we say insane, we want you to hear, pummeled by life. 15. I have never understood what people are talking about when they talk about taste. To have, lose, or acquire a taste for something, these are experiences I have had and understand. But to have good or bad taste has always struck me as a misnomer. 16. When she is away, she thinks about what it means to be at home. When she is home, she longs to be away. She can occasionally conjure the feeling of awayness while at home. This is when he feels the closest to her. 17. There's no room for autobiography in this book. 18. Given that the information is occluded, and given that the occlusion is of a kind that mere thinking cannot penetrate, and given, moreover, that the space of occlusion is a most fertile space when fear of the dark is held at bay, she determined that even if a price were set to bring the information out into the open, and even if she were able to afford, by virtue of good timing or the generosity of others, to pay that price, she would choose voluntarily and in full control of her faculties to remain in the shadow. 19. That's not an argument they would choose to replay without an audience. 20. She shifted, wiped her convictions on her sleeve, sniffled, the ground groaned, and none of this is intended to suggest confusion. 21. The center of understanding is melancholic. Arrive at the center of understanding. Find it melancholic. I didn't want this understanding after all. What I wanted was different. This understanding does not give me the difference I wanted. Does anyone understand the difference I wanted? Who determines the understanding that stands under me? 22. A degree is a thing you can get, but you cannot get a degree by degrees. If you don't get the whole degree, you haven't gotten any of the degree. Parents, but not banks, understand degrees this way. 23. Not because half-gotten degrees are meaningless, but because in their meaningfulness they describe a relation to ideology. Some parents, some banks, are also implicated in this relation. 24. She could forget ideology because the banks could not. Because the banks were fluent in ideology, the dropout could not speak it to save her life, as though she had nothing as though she had learned nothing from the system and had to find a different way to resist its ranks. 25. She never shows her hand. 26. Just the usual self-abnegation. You mean the sensation of being a fraud? Was his shock at her sensation or at the affect of its expression? Because he never doubted the authenticity of his ideological embrace, and he assumes that she identifies with her lot. 27. Self-doubt, self-worth. Self-doubt, self-worth. Self-abnegation, self-worth. Self-difference, self, self, self. I will now commence my last poem. Um, so I tend to write these long things, and it makes me very self-conscious when I read, because I feel like I've probably been reading from this poem for like a year, and it just each time it gets a little bit longer. So if you've <laughs> heard me read in the past year, you probably heard the first some percentage of this. I apologize. I stole this title too, but the rest of it is not a translation what it means to be avant-garde. I feel sad. I feel discouraged about the future. 
I feel I have failed more than the average person. As I look back on my life, all I can see is a lot of failures. I don't get real satisfaction out of anything anymore. I am dissatisfied or bored with everything. I feel quite guilty most of the time. I expect to be punished. I am disgusted with myself. I am critical of myself for my weaknesses or mistakes. I blame myself for everything bad that happens. I have thoughts of killing myself, but I would not carry them out. I would like to kill myself. I would kill myself if I had the chance. I don't cry any more than usual. I used to be able to cry, but now I can't cry even though I want to. I am no more irritated by things than I ever was. I am slightly more irritated now than usual. I have lost all of my interest in other people. I make decisions about as well as I ever could. I can't make decisions at all anymore. I'm worried that I am looking old or unattractive. I feel there are permanent changes in my appearance that make me look unattractive. I have to push myself very hard to do anything. I don't sleep as well as I used to. I wake up several hours earlier than I used to and cannot get back to sleep. I get tired from doing almost anything. My appetite is not as good as it used to be. My appetite is much worse now. I have lost more than five pounds. I have lost more than 15 pounds. I am worried about physical problems like aches, pains, upset stomach, or constipation. I am very worried about physical problems, and it's hard to think of much else. I have not noticed any recent change in my interest in sex. I have lost interest in sex completely. I was in the park when they called, with my head on my knee and my nose in a book, the book was by David Anton, an American. There are many ways to follow a thought. When the phone rang, they told me they wanted me. There was a voice on the phone that belonged to a man. It sounded like a man and him saying they wanted me. I read a book the other day by a circus performer. In my youth, I read a book by an anthropologist's son who ran off with the gypsies with his parents' blessing. He was not an American. American parents don't say yes. You can run off with the gypsies because it might be interesting. The circus performer was unstable emotionally. She committed suicide at the age of 42. The man said, we want you to come in for some tests. The parents hoped the boy would grow up to write a book in which he would detail the functioning of Roma culture. Before the phone rang, I was reading the bit in the Anton about how it's a really good thing to be on the fringe. The Roma lie to everyone except to their own. Coterie makes you soft. When I went in for the tests, they said I was normal, and only after I did a lot of research on the internet did I come to understand what they meant by that, was that my condition is unexplained. I feel downhearted and blue most of the time. Morning is when I feel the best some of the time. I have crying spells or feel like it a good part of the time. I have trouble sleeping at night a little of the time. I eat as much as I used to good part of the time. I still enjoy sex a little of the time. I notice that I am losing weight some of the time. I have trouble with constipation. My heart beats faster than usual a little of the time. I get tired for no reason a good part of the time. My mind is as clear as it used to be a little of the time. I find it easy to do the things I used to some of the time. I am restless and can't keep skill most of, still most of the time. I feel hopeful about the future a little of the time. I am more irritable than usual most of the time. I find it easy to make decisions. I feel that I am useful and needed some of the time. My life is pretty full a little of the time. I feel that others would be better off if I were dead most of the time. I still enjoy the things I used to do. I had forgotten the name of the boy who ran with the gypsies. It was mid-morning and I was sitting at my desk, taking the last sip of my morning decaf with soy. The last sip is always cold and unsatisfying. This was not my first attempt to recover the boy's name. I had, of course, forgotten the title of the book as well. I typed Dutch gypsy narrative young anthropologist into my machine. For 15 years, I have been trying to recall the name of the boy or of the book. I may even have unsuccessfully searched for it before. During those years, I recreated a memory of the narrative. He is beloved by the group and accepted as one of them. He does not miss his parents, though he holds them in high esteem. He learns to sing from a thin, dark man and to steal from a thin, dark girl. The boy himself is as blonde as a broom. The feeling of not knowing is like flying in your dreams. Around the time I started searching, I stopped dreaming anything fun. Dutch gypsy narrative young anthropologist did the trick. Her na his, his name came up and I remembered it. Recognition makes you fall, but you can try to resist, though you'll make yourself ridiculous, flapping all around. I switched windows and searched for my unexplained condition. There are lots of others who have it, and none of them can spell. 
I was wrong about the search being successful. The name I thought I recognized was of a different person, an 18th century abolitionist who fell in love with a slave. He slept with many of them, but only fell in love once. I did another search and this time left out nationality. I typed, son of anthropologists runs off with gypsies. When mysteries are explained, they don't exactly disappear. The boy was Belgian, not Dutch, and that had been my mistake. The Flemish part of Belgian, not the part where they speak French. The man called back to say one of my test results had been compromised. The title of the book is The Gypsies. Feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge nearly every day. Not being able to stop or control worrying more than half the days. Worrying too much about different things several days. Trouble relaxing more than half the days. Being so restless that it's hard to sit still several days. Becoming easily annoyed or irritable nearly every day. Feeling afraid as if something awful might. The Gypsies was republished in 1987, a time that could hardly still be called my youth. I was living in Los Angeles waiting for high school to end. My condition would not manifest for another 20 years. In the talk where David Anton celebrates life on the fringe, he is in Los Angeles at an art space called Lace. I don't know what year it was, but the talks were collected in a book that was published in 1984. So it is likely the talk took place when I was in junior high, which is what they called middle school back in the day. Growing up in a metropolis can make you soft. I've been going to the same art institutions for most of my life. You have the sense you should be heading inevitably for the center. When people ask me where I live, I say in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Under certain life circumstances, it requires effort to stay on the fringe. The first thing we know about gypsies is they make no home. David Anton bought an apartment in Manhattan in 57. It cost him $250 or 1850 every month. When I moved to Manhattan, it was 1993. I paid 400 a month to live in the East Village. I fell in love with a cook at the restaurant where I waitressed. He carried a knife on the subway because his city was dangerous. He made me feel totally, irrevocably Californian. The blizzard that winter was record-breaking. We spent our nights at the restaurant and our days in the dark room. We woke up in strangers' apartments on Avenue D. We buried two friends in a matter of months. Sometimes an image moves to the center of a life. His mother and stepfather were trained anthropologists. Looking now at the pictures, I can see we were happy. When we broke up, he accused me of leaving him for art. Eventually, he became an editor at Rolling Stone. We had a drink at a bar, and I explained my condition. He gave me many books during our four years together. One of them was The Gypsies. I can easily tell if someone else wants to enter a conversation, strongly agree. I prefer animals to humans, strongly disagree. I try to keep up with the current trends and fashions, mildly agree. I dream most nights, no answer. I really enjoy caring for other people. I try to solve my own problems rather than discussing them with others. I find it hard to know what to do in a social situation. I am at my best first thing in the morning. It doesn't bother me too much if I am late meeting a friend. I would never break a law, no matter how minor. I often find it difficult to judge if something is rude or polite. I prefer practical jokes to verbal humor. If I see a stranger in a group, I think it's up to them to make an effort to join in. I usually stay emotionally detached when watching a film. I can easily work out what another person might want to talk about. I can tell if someone is masking their true emotion. Before making a decision, I always weigh the pros and cons. I live for today rather than for the future. In The Fringe, David Anton talks about the white light. If you were born comfortable in a capital city, you know what he means. If you were born on the fringe, I can't know what you know. Despite my high score on the empathy quotient test, devised by a doctor named Simon Baron Cohen, who has two brothers in show business, directors of independent British film, another white light, bright but not blinding, like the one that shines on their namesake, Sasha, a distant relation of Simon and his brothers, so the white light shines from name to name. Empathy has been theorized in many ways. My favorite may be that of David Hume, though he never uses the word instead splitting sympathy into a complex mode of experience in which the process of understanding is reversed from impression to idea, to idea to impression. There are many ways to think about loss. The gypsies are said to originate in India, not Egypt or Romania as once was thought, and still there are gypsies living in India. I've read they make their livings selling broomsticks and tools, except the ones committed to religious begging. Many people from the white light of LA or New York 
take journeys to India to study yoga, for example. I know some of them, and they are very nice people. They probably score high on the empathy quotient test. What I'm trying to get at is impossible to say. The people we bury put us in the ground too, from impression to idea and back again. The grounding is temporary and we eventually move on. I heard some bad news when I woke up this morning. My condition had faded to the back of my mind. The news came from a friend, an Indian from India, a new friend I'd met on the organized fringe. I never knew life would be so much about death. I wrote to him that there were no words for his suffering, a tautological statement with a paradox at its heart. A week ago, we all were sitting together on the grass, indulging in the first warm rays of spring sun. The Indian was the only one sitting in the shade. This was attributed to the heat in his country of origin. Calcutta may as well be the middle of nowhere. It never topped my list of places to visit. Now empathy has made me want to get on a plane. I wonder if this is what Anton means, to be alive in the perfectly reasonable, shabby human light, my hand ahead of my heart, ahead of my hand. Crossed arms, folded arms, defensiveness, reluctance. Crossed arms with clenched fists, hostile defensiveness. Gripping own upper arms, insecurity. One arm across body clasping other arm by side, female, nervousness. Arms held behind body with hands clasped, confidence, authority. Handbag bag held in front of body, female, nervousness. Holding papers across chest, mainly male, nervousness. Adjusting cuff, watch strap, tie, etc., using an arm across the body, nervousness. Arms, hands covering genital region, male, nervousness. Holding a drink in front of body with both hands, nervousness. Seated, holding drink on one side with hand from other side, nervousness. Touching or scratching shoulder, using arm across body, nervousness. Just as I was getting to the part about Vietnam, I misplaced Anton's book in a series of temporary moves. There was a time when I might just have ordered another, but that was before the economic crash. So I am left to imagine what connections should be drawn between the war, the fringe, and the blinding white light. What we know about connections is they're often wrong. In high school, I lived in Athens, Greece a capital city if there ever was one. The gypsies made their home a few blocks from our apartment, an unofficial country on waterfront land. That was before the economic boom of the 90s and the amenities necessitated by the coming Olympics. During my temporary moves, I found a copy of The Tourist, the newer edition with a foreword by Lucy Lepard. The question of staged authenticity had been much on my mind. In her foreword, Lepard admits to having a bad memory, which she relies on to allow her to do thinking of her own. The question of staged authorship has been on my mind. There are many ways to think about origin. I frequently seek out the assistance of others. I wonder if I will eventually become inured to my condition, the way explorers acclimate to the thin air up high, that fringe of the body's ability to breathe. I woke up in a sweat convinced I was elsewhere, a tourist attraction at the back of my mind. I dreamt I had found the book I'd misplaced, that I'd read the rest of the piece on the fringe. It was full of war and art and piss, the relationship of markers to sight. Reading is traveling with blinders on. I had coffee with a geographer in Boulder, Colorado. The air was so thin I was gasping for breath. He had just returned from yet another trip to China. We talked about Anton, Lepard, and my condition. He made me feel totally, irrevocably soft. We probably never will see each other again. Later, I wrote something down in my notebook. It had to do with a feeling I had about being a tourist and something the geographer had finally said. Returning is different from covering the same ground. I held my coffee on one side with my hand from the other. Nervousness gestures to feelings fringe. The boy returned to the gypsies every year for a decade. The camp in Athens is now a seaside cafe. If you want to be the one who goes back, go back. I have no theory about how to be. The government should subsidize struggling music museums, theaters, and artists. I am troubled by the eroding distinction between entertainment and marketing. Protesters cause more good than harm. A person cannot be truly spiritual without regularly attending church or temple. Something like the theory of natural selection explains why some people are homeless. If countries are unwilling to cooperate with our military plans, we should treat them as enemies. 
I feel guilty when I shop at a large national chain. Social justice should be the foundation of any economic system. People shouldn't be allowed to have children they can't provide for. I would defend my property with lethal force. The world would be better if there were no huge corporations, just small businesses. Professional athletes are paid too much money. The separation of church and state has demoralized our society. The word of God exists only as human beings interpret it. Blind patriotism is a very bad thing. We need stronger laws protecting the environment. I would feel better if there were video cameras on most street corners to prevent crime. It should be legal for two consenting adults to challenge each other to a duel and fight a death match. I took a break from my condition to start translating a novel, a story about neo-Nazis in Paris, France. It's set in the late 90s when I was living in Paris. The protagonist and I lived on the very same street. Sometimes an address moves to the center of a life. The author of the book is politically on the left. My father lived through the German occupation of Athens. At one point, his family home was taken over by soldiers. The novel makes an argument about slippage at the extremes, how it's possible to move effortlessly from far left to far right. He offers, as an example, one Jacques Doriot, communist mayor in the 30s of Saint-Denis, a suburb of Paris at its northern fringe. My father never talks about that part of his childhood. I never can be sure that my impression of it is real. There's only one story he likes to tell about that time, the story of Apostolo Santos, also known as La Quise, who scaled the Acropolis in April of 41, tearing down the Nazi flag and putting nothing in its place. I can't look at the Parthenon without thinking of this event. Jacques Doriot turned fascist in 1936. He wore the SS uniform into his grave. Saint-Denis has a campus of the University of Paris. In 1991, I took some classes there. The students were the kind who seemed comfortable on the fringe. The graffiti on the walls has been covered up since then. I took a class on art and philosophy taught by a man named Voirnay. His name was spelled exactly like the sunglasses brand. In those days, you could smoke and drink beer inside the classroom. The professor kept his inside a brown paper bag. Apostolo Santos didn't steal the Nazi flag all by himself. He scaled the marble walls with a friend, Manolis Glezos, who later became involved with the Coalition for the Radical Left. Apostolos died in 2011 after receiving numerous awards from the government. Manolis was arrested by Athenian riot police as recently as 2012. I wonder how many times a person can be tear-gassed in his life. When I was in Professor Varney's class, I kept a low profile. Desert Storm was in the air, and I was not a proud American. We marched for peace and wages with the thousands in the streets. But nothing brought the people out like the loss of March the 2nd. Lucien Ginsburg, the Russian Jew who changed his name to Serge, sometimes a voice moves the center to a halt. When Lucien was a boy, he wore the yellow Star of David. When he tried to be a singer, he was mocked for his big nose. In 75, he released a satirical album about the Nazis. In the years that followed, he moved as if inevitably, inevitably toward the center. There's something I haven't told you that has to do with my condition. The night Serge Gansborg died, I remember all of Paris weeping. When I cry, I cry for these ungodly things. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Of course, now I'm very self-conscious about adjusting my sleeves and how I hold my arms, but you'll forgive me if I'm nervous about introducing Robert Kelly. That's probably the right height. It's my great pleasure to introduce Robert Kelly, if he's still here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Robert Kelly is the co-director of the program in written arts at Bard College. His books of poems include Kill the Messenger Who Brings Bad News from 1980, which received the Los Angeles Times first annual book award, Red Actions, Selected Poems, 1960 to 1993, Lapis, May Day, Fire Exit, and Uncertainties. He was co-editor with Paris Leary of the anthology A Controversy of Poets in 1965 and he has published several collections of essays in fiction. He's also written texts responding to work by a wide range of visual artists. Kelly lives in the Hudson Valley with his wife, the translator Charlotte Mandel. In a note to his 2011 poetry collection, Uncertainties, Robert Kelly writes, quote, formally, the poem engages with one constraint, 
Each line wants to be semantically intact. Ideally, any line could stand alone, be my last words, my epitaph. Yet it also must link syntactically or narratively with the line that follows. And each stanza must stand in like relation with the stanzas before and after." End of quote. As he goes on to note, this ability to connect and disconnect, forwards and backwards, has been emblematic of Kelly's poetry for some time. He long ago freed himself from standard English sentence structure in favor of a more mobile, ranging unit. One is tempted to call it a musical unit of sorts, for Kelly links phrases as an oral poet would. In fact, I'm going to claim that Kelly is our epic poet of non-narrative existence. Since he was a boy, as he stated in an interview, Kelly wanted poetry to be, quote, open and expansive, quote, and resistant, and resistant to an artificially contrived closure. In his recent book-length projects, Kelly consistently tests his breath and proves himself up to the epic poet's twin tasks of grace and stamina. If epic, though, then what is the struggle? What do his heroes battle against or for? There is no answer, but perhaps a clue near the end of Fire Exit when Kelly writes, quote, the conspiracy of silence silenced him as usual, the sullen, angry father of the world mortifying his son, each of us his only son. There is a language, though, where all this is not so, a language that lets you go. If he could learn it, he would be free. For most poets, epic would be mode enough. Not for Kelly's voracious poetic desire, though. In his collection, Lapis, from 2005, he shows he is a master of concise lyric as well. In a poem from Lapis, Kelly writes, quote, I'm the man who came about the language to free it from coherence and confusion both, free it from meaning and from meaningless. Because language is a different ride, a hunger strike against the tyrant mind. But this introduction would be incomplete were it not to mention the sensuality of Kelly's poetry, how the body is constantly invoked in its incursions on and from the spirit and mind. And in fact, in conjunction with his dissolving of syntactical boundaries via musical units, there is too a uniting of the various experiential realms in his poetry. Thus, a short poem from Lapis ends, quote, so the taste of blood in my mouth is the same as a word, language the first and last of all our wounds, end of quote. There is much more to be said, but it is better to hear instead from the poet himself. Please join me in welcoming Robert Kelly to Dia. Gracias, I will be Vincente. I want to speak in our native language and, and thank Vincent for the introduction. Thank Anna for the reading. Thank her for describing me so minutely in that long poem. <laughs> she, was, she was too polite to say, you, Robert, or she said, I. But apart from the constipation, that's me. <laughs> right to <there. Okay. clears throat> Sometimes I wish it were the constipation, too. So, the epic, uh, I love hearing that word because it really is, as we know, just means word, epos word, epic is the long word. I've been working for the past five years or so on a, what now appears to be a tetralogy, a four-part long poem, the first of which is Fire Exit, which I'll read a piece from, the second, The Uncertainties, that Vincent quoted from, the third is a piece called The Hexagon, which is, will be I think, published in the spring or summer. And the fourth I'm working on now called Hearthread, which I'll read from a little bit later. So let me read, um, start out one poem from Fire Exit, which is one that Charlotte actually tweeted the other night. She tweets these wonderful things. Um, 
and, and reminds me of what I wrote last week or last year. I have eye things, so I have to get the microphone and the book in the eyes in the right way. People who lose the debate are called heretics. People who win the debate are called the police. They play the game mostly in the countryside. Gods seem touchier under elms or down among the pagan elders. Godlings sulk until you touch. They love us best when we desire. Don't even have to desire them, he said. Even me will serve. Oh, love, he cried. Oh, where the subject is lost in the object. Oh, the sublation of our reluctancy into plain passion. We are not sure of our desire. We insist on it. Love, oh, great testing round of want. Oh, love is always changing the subject, kissing my cheek 20 years later and saying, I, you, clearly in my ears, so that it stays there. Like the feel of a hip where my hand rests, he said. Then there was breathed into me that numberless information I require. Relays opening and closing, old-fashioned dream machine. A hap team stimulates my fingertip. This is what the ancients called creatio mundi. Not a thing that dares to happen only once. The cosmogonic time is every moment. The primal scene arrives in front of you whenever you open your pretty eyes. This game, all full of goneness. Um, that's from Fire Exit, and I'll read from the second, the second of that set. Fire Exit is written in three line stanzas. Uncertainties in two line stanzas, the lines having those same relations that Vincent so pointedly uh, quoted. And speaking of epic, this is one I had picked to read tonight anyway, but it's 64 from Uncertainties. The world's a lot of money for a family quarrel. We're the garage where someone's auto's stored. We are mice in the shadows of machine. We have all our sciences to ease anxieties, our poesies to speed us to sleep. Sometimes big doors open by themselves, it seems. Light floods in the dirty little window only hinted at. We stand astonished as the thing rolls in. All history is scarred of such arrivals prizes for meekness and desuetude. The earth shall inherit the earth. So Isis woke and looked about her. She still is looking. We call it our thinking. It is she who haunts our neurology, hunting for the absent gesture, father power lost somewhere in our mess of meat. She plucks the strings of me. You too, muchacha. All the girl in us stands like the man she lost. Then Osiris wakes. Oh, sir is us. We are children we pretend don't understand. You don't need any other book but this. It's all in here. Only the stories are left out. Mm -hmm. I want to move to more recent work. I love to read new stuff, readings, stuff I haven't read before. At least give you a sense of what I'm up to lately. So I'll read a couple of sections, or maybe one sec couple of sections from that fourth part of the long poem called Heart Thread. Heart Thread, um, uh, hexagon yet to be pr published, is in one line stanzas. One line, pure one line by itself. But each group of six is gathered together to represent, imagine a dice or cube 
one line on each side of each face of a cube so that it could turn any which way. Nonetheless, they grouped that way. <laughs> what have I forgotten to bring? I think I... <laughs> They're tempting me. They're tempting me to do wrong. Um, that's the last part. Half thread is in 12 line stanzas sort of castrated sonnets or something like that. Circumcised would be a too race, racial a word for it. I never knew anything. It was all made up, all bluff and prophecy, willful history of our feigned race, imaginary archive of testicular witness. None of the cathedrals were real. None of the bridges, skating rinks, nudist beaches, stock markets, rainstorms on Machu Picchu, all loving lies I made for you. All Plotinus, all Shakespeare, Naj Hammadi, the lotus garden where the princess yawned, brass basins of the temple, the rights of man, national debt, all lies and all for you. Where is this up I asked you to use me to? A seashell in the sky, a grammatical awkwardness, Bruno's cavatina in music, someone's bound to die. We all are victims of perceiving. But what image is it that lingers in the dying mind? That is the real question about death. What do we go out with, wearing our curious inherited garments, what symbol nestled in the socket of the throat? So many things to remember, only one to carry with me. What is the mind before perceiving? The deep and simple well in which no star shines. Mm. Successiveness dissolves in clang. All the notes played at once of what will be a song. To use the simplest word for it, a word though now sick with commercial implication, song as commodity is the root of war. Copyright is blasphemy. All of these words are yours to begin with. I just got in the way on their way to you. Shall we end at the Milvian Bridge, where they began to confuse Christ with Caesar? Oh, throw that denarius away. His face is in the sky. No, his face is your face when you wake up. Knowing that I was going to <clears throat> read with Anna tonight, whom I was happy to meet for the first time, but no, knowing her work, I thought it wouldn't be bad if I weighed in on the political a little bit too, because lately it, it becomes hard not to. <clears throat> I've written over the past couple of years a series of poems called, with no originality whatever, Elegy. A few have been published in conjunctions. Uh, this is a recent one called Straw. On the road by the brickyard, the sweet fragrance of straw dust and the heart of an oven, cooling down already for the weekend, and who am I? Bothers me again. When I should be content with the shadow of that woman in the corner, where Liberty Avenue breaks into Queens, and the fish are frying every Friday, but I'm not. That woman is gone long ago on her own occasions. Mother of nine, mother of some new redeemer hurries to our side to wake me from my questions into the cool water of reasonable doubt. The lawyers call it that. They have a name for every unimportant thing, 
my life, your soul, the shadow of your shoulders, soft on the sidewalk, left in the mind. No matter, no matter how many years, the manumission of memory, I appeal to the court. Forget me in the forgiveness that is like fire. What did they use to fire their ovens? to bake the bricks, the ruddy mud strengthened with straw, for the least thing holds the mass together, straw from upstate, from where I am now, and the sumptuous meadows crowd with grass, and the corn stalks of November, and the smell of straw, on which the ram and his kindred bed down to sleep, the sheep of Württemberg idle on the hill, virtuously grazing on the actual. And I smell the straw of Brooklyn, straw, an immigrant like all the rest of us, Samuel and Owen and Thomas, straw, straw. And in the earth, even the memories do not abandon. We taste the dead inside the roots of what we eat, the dead inside us take flight in our music, give their sermons in our dim poetries, and to them we speak and write and curve, carve something into something else and call it ours. We are theirs, straws left over from their grassy days, from their wheat and barley, the sloppy music we remember from all their decent intervals, Tonus peregrinus, neumes of a song half sung through crying. So who am I, I said, meaning, what do I remember? All that happened in and around me is another animal, one more running away over a hill I can't follow. They throw straw on the fire, make smoke, the smoke tells them things, smoke signals from the Vatican, no, the broken down old Irishmen who landed in Vinian, Vinland, carrying their silence and their crucifixes, who lived among the Indians and said no word, monks all of them, womanless, childless, wordless in God's silence. What was there to say? They had huddled over little fires, tossed dry grass in, for some sweet smoke, or in autumn, cold like now, roared their fires with husks and cobs and straw, cob for the slow and straw for the blaze, and were content. We live in their smoke, all the beautiful old confusions of Europe, idle force, odic, Christian values, chivalry, blue flower, swirl in their campfires, monks, madmen. What did they leave behind them? to infect us when we, in our turn, got washed up on this shore. Venus mercenaria, the common clam, by the millions even in these scant salt waters up the Hudson, their names, their names on everything. And what would be the Latin for this hour? Cold knees remembering Brooklyn, what a brick feels like, plucked out of cold mud, with the grass blades still clinging? What is the core, the cure for memory, for looking at this world and seeing another? America, sure the whole place is a church, but who knows to what God? One of the things that vexes me a lot, too, is entertainment. I wrote a piece some while ago called E with a line through it uh, against entertainment. But no one would print that. That, that seemed too mean, because I'm, be, I'm very mean. I'm very mean. <laughs> so I described myself in this piece from a couple of weeks ago, I guess, as the entertainer, the anti-tainer. <laughs> what mineral wealth in lostness? Bring a cracked geode to the eerie mass, citizens quietly discussing their affairs. Discussion leads to diseases and foul weather. 
The elements are kept in balance by our peace, in pace nostra curabitur mundus, he said, and vanished in the gaunt gray mountains all around Innsbruck. Snowy peaks, hidden cameras see us deep inside the rock we think are emeralds and cobalt and gold. This diamond ring I brought from a low cloud, for thee alone, words on old radios keeping warm, the wax I model with is softer than your arm. That ringing noise can't be the telephone, ice melting maybe. Did you say Sonny Rollins? Or was it on the further side of Portugal, where the black sand sticks to white thighs? I am the entertainer. I subtract all your fun and compact it in my own nucleus to peace, peace, until it rests secure, a sapphire on your palm, among all these soft crystals, music only, oh, Venus, love, made the world stiff enough to stand. <clears throat> Um, thank you for indulging me and letting me read recent stuff. I'd like to hear how it sounds, or if it sounds, maybe. This is called A Line in Winter, A Line in Winter, not a lion, you know. Not. <laughs> I can steal titles too, but I didn't, I didn't steal it all together. I only stole it halfway, halfway home. A Line in Winter. A line in winter goes on forever. No nature to confuse its rigor, no rubato to burnish its silver shimmer, undistracted from the web. One of us, was it you, saw strung across the morning sun back then when the sun was a spider or your mother? Then we have to do nothing but remember. Nothing stops, but that's the real solution? No, no. Show fire by video, slow march into melody. When it goes slow enough, it turns into matter, elegant material at the footstep of the sea. Here we can't help but go on living. This is Samothrace. We wake up queasy, find ourselves turned into little gods, so many islands to patrol without a hawk. His heart was heavy as a house because, as if as if the ink alone made up all the news. We see no more than technology lets us be. See what happens when we have no houses. Architecture is the mother of sanity. Deer smell each other's skin from far away. We need walls to let us come together. I wanted love so hard, I wanted bone. Nobody home in the Salon of the Rejected. Everybody is born with a valid ticket finger the membrane out of his throat. But what if the mother never sang? Would silver girls still speak apocalypse, each man protecting his futile fiefdom? The woman drew me with her mind. All chalk came after at Dover and over, one mark on matter, and he began to speak. St. John listening to the book he swallowed. Everything we know becomes our ancestors. Let me go on listening to the wood grain's agenda. Our soft meeting pauses mid-sentence. One dies away, sustained on the meticulous English horn. We fear all tongues we cannot master. Not even sorrow can go on forever. That word leaps up again. To, comf com to comfort thee, lady, by the linden tree, rabbits everywhere, priests measuring the shadow no light casts. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> There's a woman in uh, Billy Chernikov who's been writing poems, quite wonderful poems, uh, erotic and sparse at once, kind of that kind of intensity that comes from sparseness, uh, about a series of tarot cards that she had gotten hold of somewhere. I don't know who made the cards, some, some 
other person. They weren't the familiar cards that we grew up with in childhood, the Tower of Marseille or A.E. Waite's deck uh, that, all we, that we all wrote about in the 60s and 70s. Um, but I got envious. Uh, I think Vincent has seen those cards, those poems of Billy's. Maybe you've seen the cards too. I've seen it. I've seen a few of them. But I'm a very envious person, being Irish, and um, uh, that's how we define our relationship to that other island um, <laughs> next door. You know, the big one with the Wel Welshmen all over it. Um, um, Envy led me to want to write tarot poems, too. But I'd be damned if I'd write about those pictures. So I had to make up a tarot deck. So I have my own tarot deck, which I call I Tarocchi Nuovi, or Major Arcana of the Sacred Ordinary. So I just want to read some of these. You must imagine for each of the items in the tarot, I don't, I don't go in for winged chariots and lions and things, but much, much more mundane because that's where we live, Mundus, the world, the mundane. Thank God for the mundane. Um, so you must imagine the image of each as a simple line drawing, as simple as you can imagine. Don't have any shading, no trees, no, no background, nothing, just the simplest thing. And I'll, I'll read a few of these to you. They're about well, they're supposed to be 22, and I have about maybe a few less than that. But I'll read three or four of them. The glass of water. <laughs> a man holds it in front of his chest. We now know what that means. <laughs> that woman. <laughs> a man holds it in front of his chest, but his eyes are not on it. They look out at you, viewer, the querent, whatever you are. Unknown to him, or at least unnoticed, there is a woman in the glass, small, perfectly formed, eyes open, rather beautiful she is, and she's looking right at you too. This is Melusina, the elemental daughter of water and air, we need her to live. When the man has drunk his water, all of it, or only some, she will still be there, adrift before his eyes and yours, floating out from the image into your world, or whatever you call this, this thing around you. And then she gives it to you. Makes me thirsty. The cellar door. You must imagine the old fashioned American angled cellar, this angled house, ground door. The cellar door stands open. It leads down to a little Galilee between the earth and how much of heaven fits in a house. A between place, like between your eyes. Such words, we rest on things, hoping they don't slip off by night. It is day now. You can see this innocent aperture leads gently down would you go down there with me if I call you by the name of another? Why should we lie? There are so many ways into a single house. I offer the low path, humid, cool down there, whitewashed stone walls, gentle menace of furnace, some um, dust, cool dust, not so different from remembering. The picture is out of breath. It just wants you to go in, humble yourself to the low ceiling of the actual. Talk to whoever you meet down there. Later you can help him up the stairs. And this is the husband. 
Charlotte asked earlier how I would draw the husband. Um, hmm. We'd see him from behind. He'd be wearing a business suit, receding hairline, but not too much visible of that from behind. You know, the husband. <laughs> if I had a husband, it would look like that, I suppose. No man in, it, in that clothing. Um, the husband. He holds a hammer in his hand. He holds a wounded sparrow in his hand. He holds a yardstick in his hand. He holds a letter in his hand he hasn't finished reading and never will. He holds a key in his hand. He holds an antique ormolu clock in his hand. He tells old time. He holds a book in his hand. It's open, pages riffled by wind. He holds a kitten curled up on his palm. He holds a photo of a lost love in his hand. He has forgotten her name. He holds a mirror in his hand but does not look at it. Who knows what he would see? He holds an ear of corn half eaten in his hand. He holds a bottle of perhaps of water in his hand. He is sustained by the simplest things. He holds a rifle in his hand. Does he know how to use it? Not sure. He holds a butterfly net in his hand. He feels ridiculous, but he loves things. He holds his hand out and a dragonfly lands on it. He holds his father's cane in his hand. He holds a big map of China, all open and dangling. He holds a silk stocking draped across his wrist. He holds a branch of holly in his hand. He holds a wad of paper money in his hand. He holds a pair of scissors in his hand. He holds a bell in his hand. He holds a dog leash in his hand, but no dog is there. He holds a wooden flute in his hand. He holds a red ball in his hand. He holds a kitchen strainer in his hand. He holds a stone in his hand. He holds nothing in his hand. This is called the flower. These pictures, no colors, how can we know a person's name if we can't tell red from green? What color are they? Let me call it blue, hydrangea, my favorite, wet, drenched even with rain or dew, a thousand flowerets on the big head, Himalayan. Tara holds one in her left hand, a flower like the sky come down to touch you. But what if it's not blue? Who are you then? Are we who we are because someone loves us? Is that all a flower means? And this is uh, the clock. The clock waits. What category do you belong to, comrade? My time, the song says, is your time or we, even earlier, make time together. The clock is just an ornament. They put jewels in them to make them go. An ornament, not necessity, like Ruskin's cathedrals, art over utility. Time, too, is useless. Ergo, also beautiful. Verweile doch, du bist so schön, cries Faust, risking everything, not to sum pretty girl, but to the passing moment, beautiful because fleeting, beautiful for being gone. And this is the last image of the turret. I don't know what picture it would show, but this tries to find out. If there were a final card, last trump, a picture all sleek and elegant as you know what, some young body flexed to spring or pleasure, a smooth remembrance, nothing more needs to be said. Divinatory meaning of such a thing, what could that be? You have come to the end of asking. You are oily with answers. When you sit down, you are Isis, and when you stand up, Apollo. When you lie down to go to sleep, you are no one again. It is the picture of a nude young man 
or perhaps a woman, half seen through shrubbery, his or her hands are holding something you will never see. Not even when, hours later, when the sun is finally setting and your cup of mint tea is cold, you slip into the picture and become him, become her, and still don't know what you mean. There has some day to be an end to naming things. So, those of you who've been at readings of mine before know that I have a superstition by now, a compulsion, to end any reading, which I will do now, with the most recent poem finished, Good, Bad, or Indifferent. This is sort of indifferent, I think. Do I have to know the things I say, or is it just enough to say them and let another mean them? That other, maybe, that Dante hears them talk about down below, the long below. Don't call it hell. Hell, like Hades, is the name of a person. Hell was a woman, Hades a man, but neither ruled where Dante went, or said he went, all ears and eyes, attending the excuses that they used to calm their sufferings, those sufferers who lived there in that place, where he heard them talk how this or that pleased another, another, close as they could come in their pain to say who that other might be. So one talks and one listens. Between them both, a thing is said. Thanks. <laughs>